Hi, Will. Thank you so much for coming to BizTalk. How are you? Uh, good, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks to you. Uh, thank you for your time. So let's start giving an introduction yourself before we talk about CISA. So I'm a civil engineer. I did a PhD in modeling extreme ocean waves uh, many years ago from Imperial College. And I've since spent most of my career working in or around sort of numerical modeling and or engineering, and also in sort of the marine environment, um, which then brings me into the work we do with CSAIL. Great. So let's start talking about CSAIL. I'm very excited. It's something unique for me. So what we do is we provide um, reefs that um, attenuate the waves to actually sort of hold, you know, to reverse the effects of climate change. So if I run you through these slides fairly quickly. Um, so we've had a, you know, we've, we've had a lot of, a lot of um, press over the last couple of years. I mean, it's a quite an exciting, interesting area that we're working in. But what we fundamentally do is we install steel cages in the ocean. Um, and this is on the left-hand side here is an example of what we've built um, in Mexico, which is about 120 meters long. And these structures have an almost instant um, benefit for the marine environment. So you, you see a huge increase in the number of fish and marine life around these structures. But that's not really what we're about. What we're, our goal is, is to break, those, break the waves before they reach the shore. The reason we do this is um, fundamentally because <clears throat> If you I mean, look around the world, um, and this is a picture taken from a, a hotel in Playa del Carmen in, in Cancun, they have seen a dramatic loss of their coastline you know, in a very short period of time. So the photo on the left is from a Google image taken in 2017. I first took this photo on the, on the right in 2019, and you can see that they've lost about 30 to 50 meters of beach. And this is replicated around the world. So we estimate from the analysis we've done there's around about 51 percent of all shorelines are or sandy shorelines are experiencing increased erosion so they are um you know reducing in size now the the, the solution as is often the case is is na nature sort of derived so coral reefs themselves are phenomenally successful at holding back waves and preventing um, erosion. So <clears throat> this wall of white water that you see on the white, on the right hand side here is directly above the start of a, a, a reef. And as the waves come in, they steepen, they uh, often break, and they and as soon as they break, they lose their energy through, through turbulence. And the result is that the water on the right is actually very calm and, um, um, you know, in, and safe. But Crucially for you know for the, the world, islands like the Maldives wouldn't exist if it wasn't for coral reefs. An awful lot of the sort of the um, Mexican eastern coast is protected by coral reefs. And overall, the, the world estimate, well, we reckon there's around about 200 million people who are directly protected in this way. So this is what we're, we're aiming to sort of replicate. So the sea cell solution is really made up of four key elements. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, we install this steel structure. We then um, install onto that some electronics that we call C cell sense, which I'll explain in a while in a second. But that's principal goal of that system is to provide um, a very small current that is used to grow um, rock using a technology called mineral accretion. So if you do, um, essentially we're doing electrolysis in water and that causes minerals are naturally found in the sea to, to precipitate out and form the rock around our um, or structure. In some ways, that's similar to what you see, say, in a kettle when you boil it. You see um, minerals in the water settling out at the bottom of your kettle. But sea cell sense for us is an awful lot more than just um, providing that power to drive the mineral accretion. We're also using it to actually collect data. Um, and that's a big part of our business and certainly a big part of what we're going to be doing as we go forward. So it's using, um, first of all, information around, you know, temperature, what the waves are doing, but also, you know, what we're seeing in terms of the rock growth. We're also now moving into that area of actually monitoring the marine environment and seeing you know, what's changing in terms of fish, um, pollution levels, et cetera. Now, the third element is, is as I've alluded to, is actually to grow in the rock. The, the reason for this is, you know, the reason we want to grow that rock is that we want to install a quite a lightweight, simple structure in the ocean. And then we want to get the bulk and the weight of that structure really from the minerals that are naturally available within the sea. And as I've said earlier, our goal here is to attenuate those waves, to call those waves to break or to lose some energy. And 
it doesn't have to be as dramatic as causing the waves to, to break as you see here. It can often be just removing 10, 20% of the energy from those waves. Um, that is what we've seen in the last 10, 20 years in terms of climate change. You know, many areas they've seen the, the wave climate going up by um, anywhere from sort of one to 2%. Um, the, the, the world average is 0.4% year on year. So what we're trying to do is just wind the clock back, wind the clock back 10, 20 years as, as is appropriate for each, each region. Now, what's neat about what we're doing is as soon as you install those reefs, we see a, a huge benefit in terms of, of, of fish. Fish in themselves bring uh, an awful lot of benefits to a, a region. They not only eat away algae and other sort of pollutants that might sort of collect on your structure, but they also provide nutrients for things like seagrass. Seagrass in itself is, is a fantastically um, fantastic plant that helps to clean the water and also remove CO2. And the rock that we're growing is also hugely beneficial for um, I mean, corals or bivalves because they can attach onto that. They don't really want to attach onto, onto steel or, or wood. What they want is a nice textured rocks finish, and that's what we provide, um, which it makes it very easy for them to connect onto it and, and grow accordingly. And the the and then obviously the the, the the coming out of that is what I talked about in the wave attenuation and you know causing these waves to break and you know, prevent the erosion. Now, if you then pan out yet further, you can actually start to see, you know, if, if we can enhance fishing, fish, we can enhance, you know, improve things for the fishing community. I mentioned, you know, we can do seagrass, we can do carbon capture with corals, we can provide dive attractions. I mean, dive attractions are a, is a huge, huge market, it's worth something like 9 billion um, before the pandemic. Um, there's equally a huge amount of marine research going on and around corals. I mean, corals are um, extraordinarily beneficial to our marine life. 25% of all marine life um, live in coral reefs and or were born in, were born in, in those reefs. And if we lose them, it's going to have a dr dramatic impact on our, on our, um, on our food chain. Uh, and then coming up to the top side of here, you know, we can protect coasts, we can lower people's insurance, we can help to restore beaches. And with beaches, for example, there's a very close correlation between the amount of sand a hotel has on its beach and how much um, they can charge for their rooms and or the occupancy of their hotel. And then you moving back towards the, the left top, top left hand side of this diagram um, through our sea cell sense technology. It's for us, it's a, it's and, and in many ways the future of the company is around the, the data that we can collect and the sense that we can make around that data. You know, we know in some ways less about the surface or, or sorry, the oceans of this world than we do about the surface of Mars. And we'd like to see if we can change that uh, in a quite, quite a dramatic way. And, and then finally, um, we always try to work with the local community. You know, they actually end, end up building these structures. They will install those structures. Uh, what we do is provide the intelligence, the blueprints, as, as you, if you, if you like, to how how we um, how, how it's done. And this is really our sort of initial target market. You know, as I mentioned, hotels are very dependent on the sand in front of them. Um, just by nudging the occupancy rate of a hotel by about one to two percent, we can pay for our system. Equally, a lot of coastal communities have spent a huge amount on this prime land and they are just seeing it washed away. You know, this area of Telcheck, for example, they were losing about half a meter a year um, just for erosion. And this is where we, we're, we're working to stop that. And more globally, you've got erosion going on throughout the world. It's, you know, it's not unique to the Caribbean or East Coast of the UK. It is, it is, it is happening. At a, at a international level. Uh, the UN estimates that we need to be spending about 120 billion a year to address climate change and the flooding that resulted to that. We think that number's a bit bit high, but it's certainly in, in the realm of about sort of 30, 30 billion a year um, as the sort of total addressable market. For us, we've narrowed that down and said, okay, let's just focus in on those sandy shores and where there's, ha you know, there are people, you know, there are buildings and also where, um, um, we think it's politically feasible to operate and you end up with a, a, a serviceable addressable market of about 7 billion. And if you take about 15% of that, which is a, um, a quite a conservative estimate of what we think we can achieve, you have a market of about one and a half, so 1.1 billion a year. Um, and the competition is is really broken up into sort of three main areas. First of all is these sort of hard solutions. This is often what you'll see when you go into say Dover docks or big ports. So it's 
a technology or an approach that really hasn't evolved much since the Romans. You take a large rock, you throw it in the ocean, and you just keep piling them up until, you know, you stop the waves. And of course, with modern technology, we've got smart and we can now make angular concrete units and, and pile them up. Um, it's extraordinarily expensive, very effective. I mean, I'm not going to deny that, but it's in a very, a very heavyweight solution. The other option is that what you see a lot of um, is beach replenishment. I mean, this is really a sticking plaster. You know, you've lost some beach, just go and find some sand and throw it back on again and just wait for it to wash again away again. So it's it's, it's not a solution as such, but it, it gets you a quick fix. And there's a lot of companies who are building quite extensive fleets, um, just driving up and down, as you see in this picture, moving sand from one place to another, and they'll just have to repeat that. And out of just desperation, what we, we now see is an awful lot of companies, um, I mean, hotels, but with that particular, looking for cheap solutions. And this is one of the ones we see most prevalently in, in Mexico, um, which is, is, is a technology known as geotubes. And this is essentially large, a large sandbag. Um, it's almost like a sausage. And you fill that with sand. Um, has quite a lot of ecological impacts both in terms of its creation but also it breaks down over time and then you you've got plastic washing around all over the place i mean these last about sort of three to five years because they break down in the sun um the way we see ourselves in terms of uh, you know growing as a business i mean as with any business we're here to scale we, we want to have a measurable impact on the climate and on, on coasts around the world so we can't be everywhere we can't do all of that ourselves so C cells business is really on this right hand side of this picture. It's it's around the, the modeling, it's around the, the design of the systems and the structures we put out. So it's it's using data and using information that we collect from the natural environment, making sense of that and building appropriate solutions for that for that for the environment. Um, and then we hand all of that over to our partners. So we for example, we have um, you know, several partnerships out in Mexico. We've recently signed an agreement, an agreement with Terror Army um, through one of their subsidiaries, which is Reinforced Earth in India. And they they get involved in the actual, you know, the, the groundwork. So they do the surveys, they apply for the permits, they will install the structures, um, and they provide the maintenance all the time, you know, with our sort of blessing and our support uh, on the right hand side. And then, as I've said, as I said at the beginning, we see as we evolve as a company, an awful lot of what we are going to be doing is around that data capture and using that to really try to understand our oceans, you know, understand what's going on in terms of our fish populations, how, why, you know, why do fishes, you know, fish populations reducing in one area, increasing perhaps somewhere else, you know, what external factors have, ha have happened, can we provide early warnings to people, uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, that's just one example. Um, there's thousands of areas where we feel, you know, the data that we can collect, we can actually utilize in a really positive way. Um, and to make all of that happening, um, we we have a, a fantastic team, um, still a relatively small team. So we're looking to raise quite a significant amount of money as we move into this next uh, quarter in the beginning of the next year um, to sort of grow out the team and, and bring in some um, additional capabilities to sort of strengthen out our sort of commercial um, capabilities and offerings. But as it stands, we have our main office in London. I have um, a small team in, in Madrid and a small team in over in, um, in Mexico. And as I mentioned, we've got some really good good partnerships with both Axis EMA in Mexico and Terra Army. And that's it. Thank you so much. It's very, very interesting. I mean, I was born in a village on the coast, <laughs> very much on the coast. So I see with my eyes, witnessing, I mean, witnessing how the coast and the erosion can affect everything. So we had a massive storm, but also, which is destroyed almost everything years ago when I was still a young boy. But also, the reduction of the length of the beach is absurd, it's enormous. So uh, I'm very happy you are working on something similar. I do agree. I'm nothing against uh, rocks. Actually, uh, where I am today, where, where I was born, uh, we have huge rocks that try to break the waves. Uh, roughly 100 meters uh, starting from the beach. Uh, they did a good job. But as you say, it's extremely, extremely expensive. And I do not think can be done uh, by pride hotels and so on so as to be done by public funding so i do believe your your mm, your way to deal with this problem is absolutely extraordinary now can i ask you 
Uh, we start from the end and we move to the beginning. Uh, who, are, who is paying for your service today? When we, following our last sort of major round of funding, we we really did a, a big drive in in Mexico. Um, so our first big reef is actually installed or paid for partly by a, um, a group of um, um, homeowners on the northern coast of the Yucatan. So we've since then done some smaller sort of pilot projects with hotels in, in the Yucatan. The biggest project we have, or the biggest ongoing project we have now is with the Israeli government. So there they have around about uh, 120 kilometers of coastline, around about 45 of which is actually being washed away. Um, so we're working, you know, working in a, in, a, in a sort of very staged approach with them. So we are um, testing. We've got um, three units out there now just testing the rock growth. Um, she's done really, really well. Um, and then this this one, the next couple of months, we'll be installing um, some pilot units with them. I mean, they're, they're being, and hopefully by the end of next year, we'll have had a, have about a kilometre of reef installed with them. I mean, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixture. So we've, in other words, we've, we've got hotels. We haven't really broken into the hotel market just yet, but we, we've got some, a number of good leads going on there. Uh, we've got governments in Israel and we've got homeowners. I mean, terms of structure uh, is the same. For example, the one that an hotel yep. can use and the one maybe a government can use because they can spend more money. Or And it, how, far, how far you can go from the cost? So it depends a bit on the what we call the bathymetry of the of the of the seafloor. You know how how deep is the water and how quickly is how quickly does it get? Um, you know, yeah, how how quickly does it get really deep? Yeah. So in in Mexico, for example, we're about a hundred meters from the shoreline. In in Israel, we are likely to be about one hundred and fifty, maybe even two hundred meters from the shore. Um, Israel, the units are going, to, are going to be in the order of about two and a half meters in height, whereas in Mexico, they're only about 1.3 meters in height. Okay. So we we, we, we have a range of sizes. Uh, we're not trying to, we don't really want to create a bespoke solution for every site, but we are going to have, we are going to have probably about three different um, tiers or, or sizes of structure. And as you can appreciate, um, the larger ones are significantly more expensive and probably lend themselves more to sort of being funded by the governments, whereas smaller structures are, you know, fit more appropriately with homeowners. That said, we're not, that's not really our, our thinking when we go into the design. You know, it, it's, um, we're there to affect an appropriate change. And, you, you know, you, you design the, the solution according to the, you know, the natural environment. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm Italian. And we had a very funny, we had a very terrible story with the Mosa protecting uh, Venice, which you probably mm -hmm. know. We spent yes, yes. Years. I don't know. I mean, it's uncountable much of money. But uh, I'm, 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 I don't want to talk about this. But uh, when it comes to this structure, what, what is the most important? How tall they are or how wide they are? Uh, Probably of the two, the height. Um, you don't want them to be too far below the surface. So in, in tidal areas, that can become a slight problem. Um, but in Mexico, the tide's pretty, you know, it's, it's pretty minimal. But you're, 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 the closer you are to the water surface, the bigger impact you will have on, on the waves going over it. But if, if you want to have a structure that's deeper, because, for example, you may want to have boats passing over, then the width becomes then the you know the the key factor. Okay. Uh, how and this is more for me to understand. How do you fix them? Uh, how how exactly the setup works? When you say fix, as in you yeah. repair or or how are they placed? Yeah, exactly. How they uh, the structure? How they are posed? For example, inside the water. So they they all I mean for the tail check we, we there's a couple of different anchoring methods we use but the the, the, the structure itself has um, anchors that go below it that go actually into the sand or are you know if you're on rock you would be bolting onto the rock itself right okay. so they they're, they're locked in position um, the units we've had in Mexico have all been hit by at least one if not two or three hurricanes um, and we've had no issues so the 
and, and that's actually been a big part of our development is actually working out how to efficiently install the anchors anchor systems for these reefs me uh, how many applications do you have already we've got three three in mexico or well, technically four but we're decommissioning one of those and uh one in or two in Europe, and we're now and we've just started um, project or well, well a project in Israel. So we're, we're still quite early stage. Uh, for what, do you, what is your experience in terms of um, me uh, try to prevent, okay, but also in terms of the cost has been already uh, the erosion has been already there. Can you bring the cost? I, I don't want to say back as it was before but how much can gain again uh it totally depends on what's going on in the environment so the what, what's important to remember is that um if you, if you can see my fingers right imagine this is the coast running across okay um the 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 way to think about it is the coast is a series of sort of cells which may be represented by my fingers now every every year sand will move from one you know the currents tend to go in one direction. So in, in northern Yucatan, it's an east, so it's a westerly current. So the waves come in, those waves are actually, um, there's the, the water within the wave is being moved towards the, towards the coast. So that has to run away, or run back out into the ocean. And when it does that, it creates a current, which is, if you have a sort of horseshoe type bay, you get rip currents, which a lot of people are familiar with, right? It's a very similar process. Um, and it's those currents that are actually moving the sediment. So then what the waves do is they come in and they break up the beach. They break up bigger rocks into smaller rocks or, or you know, if you've got some uh, land, it'll smash it up, re release that material from around the roots of trees, et cetera. So that's what the waves do, but they don't actually take it anywhere. They just move, they just get it into suspension. It's the currents that actually move it elsewhere. So this is where the, the, my hands come into place and sort the cells. So every year, if you go and stand at one point in the, on a beach, um, well, every day, actually, you will see a little bit of sand moving from one cell to the next or moving. And it, it may only be a couple of centimeters. It may be a couple of meters. And that's fine if sand moves from here to here and sand that was here moves over to this. So, you know, everything moves together. So I, I don't know. The problem is, is if I start taking sand away from here, but it's not being replenished from further upstream, then what happens here is that this beach starts to actually reduce the size whereas this one may start to increase right and that's really the game you're playing you're trying to um you're trying to i mean what why we're seeing erosion is because those currents are coming in are actually being changed in their nature very often they're diverting sand further out to sea which means it then gets into very deep water and it's then lost um and equally the what people are doing is they they're installing say a barricade here and that then starves the, the you know the downstream cells from from receiving the sand that they would have otherwise received okay so what we're doing when we build our structures out here was we're just trying to look, reduce that whole climate we're reducing the size of the waves we're reducing the size of that current so and the water then passes through that region which is going to do anyway and it's natural and you want it to happen in many ways because it's, it's helping to sort of refresh things okay. um as the water slows down because the water's you know the, the area is less less uh, aggressive um, it will deposit sand i mean it's just like a river you know if you have a fast moving river it will move a house if you have a slow moving river it's you know it can only move very small things and if you therefore if you can slow the speed of those currents you can cause min uh, minerals that are being carried by that flow to sort of settle out and, and stay in a, in a particular region we accept for cost erosion where do you see the best application of your system um except for um I mean, for example data yeah uh, or even uh creating new co reef, uh, corals yeah so, so we haven't i mean there an awful lot of research in, and the mineral accretion technologies is not new to us it's it's you know something that's been around for a long time um and it has been used to sort of try to in, um, reinvigorate existing coral reefs and encourage um, the growth of corals and there's some, quite a lot of success there what's what's needed in terms of the battle with the loss of coral reefs is is largely structures on which um, they can place these new coral reefs you can't just take a coral and just put it on plain sand it will just disappear so we see ourselves providing first of all that, that you know a backbone upon which you can then subsequently put corals and but that's the sort of secondary benefit to us our first objective is you know cover that in rock create a, a suitable barrier 
So it's that it, it, you know um, has the effect that we want on those waves, right? Unlike you know some of those pictures I showed you, we're not building a, a like a solid barrier against the sea. We want the waves to actually pass over. We want smaller waves to go through. What we want to do is we want to affect a change to those bigger waves so they lose some of their energy before they hit the shore. And the 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 it, the effect of that is really quite dramatic. It means we don't need a really solid structure. We are it's it's akin to me tripping you up with my you know. You can run across a road and you can tripped up by a, a 2p coin for example yeah um and you can cause an awful lot of damage whereas if you run at me and i try to stop you i'm probably going to lose yeah so it, it's that's the that's the approach that we're taking in terms of what we see ourselves doing with the data the, it, that becomes um a really really interesting topic because there is just so many different things you can take it take it do with this from you know simple things like just you know reporting on what the, what's what's going on with the wave environment that perhaps that can be fed into uh weather models and you know local surfing websites could use that information to actually understand you know what, what's going on i mean a lot of them have that information already but we can provide more data points that feed into that um for hotels looking at you know work that, that looks at the turbidity of the water you know how clear is it so if people want to know if they want to go snorkeling in a particular region or want, they want to go out in the sea are they going to see anything we should be able to tell them that before they even get it get 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 wet um then you get up the next level is you know looking at what's actually going on with fish um you know what's the amount of you know the the, the amount of sort of moving biomass in, in a way out there you know i mean living creatures out there what's what's going on with those um i'm about to meet next week with uh, cornell university who've done some awesome stuff where they use acoustics to actually measure the health of a reef or measure the health of a, of a, of a, a marine area um, by effectively listening listening for the sounds of all the fish um, next step up from that of course is well not really a step up but in parallel to that is uh, using video cameras um, there's we've done some quite interesting work um, and it's i mean it's a lot of the people have done this where you know you use um, um, artificial intelligence to recognize different types of fish so now you can start to start to build up a, a, an accurate understanding of you know which fish are in which regions different times of the year um, start to correlate that with what's going on acoustically because video cameras are great but when it's dark or it's cloudy or the water's really turbid you can't see anything so acoustics becomes really cool now you start to actually integrate that you know so what's happening in this region how does that compare to what's going on over there you know if we see a pollution event here do we see something else correlate to that can we detect coral spawning can we detect pollutants can we detect high levels of nitrates in the water you know it's it's almost endless um and what we've we're doing with the the latest version of our c cell sense platform is essentially providing the same technology that you have in your phone here um so you're we're all familiar with now with sort of wireless charging you'll be able to in a couple of months be able to take your phone you'll be able to connect it up to our reefs and just connect it up to our boxes and we'll charge your phone for you for free underwater now that's not particularly wow, you know, why would you want to do that? But what we can now do is we can provide um, some very simple, cheap electronics to, to teams around the world who can design instrumentation um, that we can power. And in addition to providing the power to them, we also provide them with a data connect connection back. So they can now communicate real time with those devices and send information back. And they can literally design something that wouldn't look not too dissimilar from say this phone, they can go out to Mexico or Israel or the UK or wherever we happen to have a structure, um, plonk this on, let us know, we'll connect them up and they, you know, they immediately can start, start to extract data. You're an endless number of applications. How much are you for racing now, if you're for racing? Uh, at least uh, north, north of 2 million, but it's probably going to be nearer 5 million. We're still working out the details. Five million, and uh, exactly for developing what? For what was going to be the use of this funding? Um, a combination of things. The majority of it will be, I mean, divided up into almost sort of three three main areas. Uh, Third is, is around sort of sales, marketing, you know, driving the 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 um, acceptance or you know, building up that client base, right? Um, a third of it will be going into sort of research and development 
So that would be a, a lot of our work around, you know, sensors, including improving that sort of communications. Also, um, we're doing some really interesting work around rock growth. We've won some fantastic UK funding looking at, um, for example, can we replace the use of steel within our reefs? You know, steel has got quite, still quite a lot of carbon within it. Uh, we'd like to actually, you know, mitigate that. Um, and then the 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 other third is is really about sort of building up um, partnerships and almost like the, so so you've got core research and then sort of product development and, and rolling out reefs around the world. I mean, you're an entrepreneur. So what's your vision? Where do you see your company in three five years time? Where do you want to be? Um, we want to be one of the dominant um, sort of data providers. Um, so providing fantastic, you know, using information about our oceans to design, you know, amazing structures, um, be that reefs or be that um, other other you know facilities out at sea, and um, in combination with you know collecting data from around every single thing that we touch, right? So that we can actually utilize that, be that using it to model um, ocean waves, which really goes back to sort of my 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 roots uh, in my PhD through to um you know modeling perhaps you know movements of fish around the ocean yeah so we see ourselves increasingly as a as a, as, as a data company rather than a, 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 a coral reefs company but we are or sorry even a reef company but right now you know our focus is on building reefs and and then as we start to uh, extract more and more data from that we then want to you know make more sense out of that and then we see already there are a number of other avenues where we can use that information um in a, in a productive way and it's always going to be it's not going to we're not going to become computer scientists and you know forget about the engineering it's always going to be a blend between engineering and but using smart data um or information that we collect from the ocean really understanding it digesting that and then providing really innovative solutions and i think you know reefs are always going to be a big part of that but as an example um why can't we install structures around wind turbines yeah uh we're already in talking you know we're talking with a couple of developers in the uk uh, about installing reefs not for coastal protection but for to create habitats to to enhance the marine life around around structures we can also work with the wind turbine guys to understand what sound they're, they're making and how is that impacting on say the fish in the area and it's, it's always possible that the wind wind turbine actually promotes fish um it, equally there may be sounds or or certain noises that, that discourage fish you know so can we help to offset some of that or, or work to understand what's going on there yeah so we don't you know we want to work with universities and groups but we really want to be become almost like the internet of the sea and provide that infrastructure onto which other people can attach me if you can send a message to investors what you should invest in CISA and yourself and your team um well first and foremost we've got you know a phenomenal team um we've got a phenomenal sort of um, everything from you know the people who work here to 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 the advisory board that are helping me to sort of structure and shape this business um and then going up to you know we've got some a really interesting product in a market that's um you know there there are there are competitors there are people working in this space but it, it is really undeveloped and it's a really sort of fresh area. You know, climate change, coastal erosion is something that's really arisen in, in is really starting to impact people in the last sort of five, five, maybe 10 years in some places, right? So it's a really fresh challenge. And as I said earlier, most people, you know, most of the sector has, hasn't really gone, they haven't really done anything smarter than what the Romans did. You know, we need to move beyond that, you know? Um, and we think we're a company to do that. Will, thank you so much for coming to Beastalk. It's been a very great pleasure for me. Thank you.